Welcome to another spirit-filled message on Christocentric message. If you're new to this channel, I would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video. As well, I would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth, it's going to bless you. Your graces are going to be imparted unto you and then God is going to visit you. Mark Thank you for 16, watching. 15 to 20. And he said unto them, the he being Jesus, Go ye into all the world, take note now, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 17. It says, And this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. The last verse, and they went forth and preached everywhere in obedience. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Scripture number two, Matthew chapter 28, please from verse 18 to 20 if you must understand the great commission then we must examine the three foundational scriptures that capture the mandate the instruction that jesus gave to his disciples that apply to all believers today and jesus came and spake unto them saying all power the word power there's the word exousia it should be authority all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth 19 go ye therefore now we see another account go ye therefore and teach all nations mark's account says preach the gospel to every creature matthew is now telling us teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and whilst you do this lo i am with you all way even to the end of the world amen are you ready for the third scripture acts chapter 1 please from verse 6 reading down to 11. these are the three foundational scriptures upon which the mandate of the great commission rests when they therefore were come together they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Eight. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come on you, upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth verse 9 and when he had spoken these things while they beheld him he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight verse 10 and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven praise the name of the lord so three scriptures mark's account matthew's account and now the account that the book of acts gives us all of these accounts are pieces together that when brought with understanding help us understand the great commission please write what is the great commission the Great Commission is a mandate given by Jesus. The Great Commission is a mandate given by Jesus to his disciples and now it extends to all believers. A mandate given by Jesus to his disciples and now to all believers to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. I'll take it again the great commission is a mandate given by jesus to the disciples then and now it extends to all believers to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation 
and then to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship it's a long definition but you must write all of it number one to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation you add a comma there to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship and then finally to consequently i wrote here bring territorial and societal transformation a mandate given by jesus to the disciples and now all believers to number one reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship and then to consequently bring territorial and societal transformation hallelujah you have that down so you see that if you want to really understand the great commission the mandates that jesus left with the church you will if you examine mark's account alone it gives you one dimension and you will not fully accomplish the great commission if you look at matthew's account alone it brings a piece of the truth you see there is only one thing greater than the truth the whole truth are we together now yes if you have a piece of the truth and you do not have the whole truth your adventure will be lopsided it will not be holistic and now in Acts chapter 1, we see the last piece. He says, you are witnesses and that your witness should reach Judea, uh, Samaria, Judea, Jerusalem, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And all these were statements that Jesus himself made. So we're not just saying these are statements that one prophet made somewhere. Jesus himself made the statement in Mark, the statement in Matthew, the statement in the book of Acts immediately we see that there are three components to the mandate that jesus left with the church this will be my discussion tonight there are three components to what we call the great commission three components to the mandate that jesus left with the church let's discuss them now number one the first component in the great commission as we see is world evangelization please write Math, Mark 16, 15 again. Please give it to us. World evangelization is the first component as far as the mandates, the great commission that Jesus left with the church is concerned. And he said unto them, please look up, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hallelujah. So we are given the mandate to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. What we should do is very clear. Preach. To preach means to declare. To preach means to proclaim. To preach means to announce. To preach means to bring to your awareness. And the content of our preaching is the gospel when it has to do with the gospel the message is ever the same gospel the gospel of salvation hallelujah and i have taught us here but for this teaching let me repeat it again in the clearest terms as much as i i, I want us to be deep in our understanding of the kingdom it is important that we must have a basic foundational knowledge of the gospel of salvation what we call the gospel or the gospel of salvation is a revelation of the Father's love revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Are we together? Man and creation being the object of that sacrifice to the end that any man who believes according to scripture that we are saved, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. This was the mission of Jesus when he came to die. He came to die to reconcile us, the Bible says, through the shedding of blood. Are we together now? So it's important for us to understand that the first component that is captured in the Great Commission, the mandate that Jesus left with the church, is world evangelization. And when Jesus was speaking about the harvest, he said, Pray ye the Lord of the harvest 
the Lord of the harvest, the word Lord there means the owner, the supervisor. That is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who was left with the church. Are we together? That he may send laborers so that there can be an acceleration as far as the harvest is concerned. Now, I want to point out something here. Give us Mark 16 again. I want you to look very carefully at this scripture. The instruction that Jesus gave as far as world evangelization is concerned is very clear. He says, go ye. The word go ye there means that he expects action. Go ye means be strategic. Go ye means be prepared to take action. It is not a passive word. It does not demand carelessness or laxity. Go ye means there has to be energy, passion that is invested into this instruction. The location is all the world. That means there is nowhere across the globe that should be spared as a mission field. In the mind of Jesus, everywhere on earth qualifies to be called the mission field. No matter how dangerous, no matter how peaceful, in the mind of Jesus, everywhere the entire line mass of earth where men can be found qualifies to be called a harvest or mission field. So go ye all the world and then the instruction is to preach. I told you earlier to preach means to declare, to proclaim, to bring to your awareness. Then he told us the content. The content of our preaching is the gospel. But notice, he never told us how. He told us what to do. Go ye, what to preach, the gospel, who to preach to, every creature, where, the entire world. But he left the matter of strategy. Why? Because we will need to adjust. He allowed the strategy to be flexible because we will need to reinvent strategies. The mission remains the same, go ye. The mission field remains the same, all ye, the world. And the, the message is to preach the gospel to every creature. But how we will do it, he left it to the creativity of the times. Are we together? Yes. That the way the gospel was preached in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even as far back as 10, 20 years ago, because of the changing times and the reality in our world today, there has to be intelligence invested to world evangelization. God has provided us through technology, for instance, very effective tools of getting the message. Nobody would have imagined that through technology from one point, you can be communicating the gospel to literally everybody across the globe. Hallelujah. We must develop effective end time strategies, I wrote here, for the task of world evangelization. I submit to you that the rate at which evangelism is happening globally speaking is very slow compared to God's expectation and with respect to the time we have left there has to be intelligence outsourced from the spirit more effective methods one-on-one -on -one evangelism as powerful as it is will only end us in frustration a few statistics for your understanding we have about 8 billion people approximately last I checked on earth today and Christianity as we know that includes everything that is called Christianity. It's about 2.8 billion people. So we have 2.8 billion practicing Christians who are alive today, statistically speaking. Are we together? And if it took that long to have this kind of harvest, in how many hundreds and thousands of years will it take to be able to cover the globe with the message? It then means there has to be an intelligent idea there are people who have come up for instance from a standpoint of technology did you know that the amount of people who subscribe to many of the apps and some of the technological products we have on earth are way more than 2.5 billion that means human beings have invented an idea that is more in is more um, productive than the gospel because the world received their ideas and all those ideas are not more than 20 years old. Are we together? 
20 years ago, many of the social media platforms we have today were not there or were not the way they are now. That means that the believer in approaching the subject of world evangelization, understanding the message is not enough. Our next assignment must be to work in partnership with the Lord of the harvest to come up with effective end time strategies of ensuring and insisting that the lost get the message whether they make they they respond positively to the message or not is up to them but that we have a mandate by god to deploy every scriptural means to get the message with clarity and unambiguity to the lost are we together this is the mandate jesus gave us that means if you are alive today as a believer and your life is not about this as far as god is concerned you are not part of his program world evangelization is not a mandate for evangelists and missionaries in the mission field world evangelization is every believer's mandate did you listen if you ever say you love jesus or you love a man you would want to listen to his final words and heed to it and make sure you plunge your life into anything that makes that mandate come to pass the final words of men even in our world today are precious we keep them before a man transits in glory we listen carefully for the final words, the expressions, and we take it serious. And Jesus Christ, before his transition to be seated at the right hand of the Father, his emphasis was the Great Commission. And I'm saying that the first dimension, the first component is world evangelization. Please look up. You are a believer today because you got saved. Our dear sister, the lady who was here giving her testimony um, someone took responsibility and preached Jesus to her and gave that young lady a chance to now bring order to her life. It is amazing how many believers around us never have an opportunity to hear the gospel because subliminally, believers have been programmed to downplay the relevance of the gospel and believe that it is for people in the village who most likely do not have clothes to wear. Are we together? And there are many people, the moment we have some kind of superior orientation, we believe that we are not, the gospel is not necessary. So in our minds, we believe that the gospel is a product to the poor man or somebody in the rural area. And that is wonderful, but you will be surprised to know that people in the rural area are at least a lot more spiritual than modern people. They are closer to spirituality, whether by witchcraft or whatever. Their faith is purest in the rural areas because they have no options. Healthcare is almost zero, a lot of things, and then they survive in health because they have learned how to combine leaves plus a spirit plus other things to remain alive. Are we learning now? This is very important. When Jesus comes and as he begins to reward men, the Bible clearly tells us that the reward of the believer is going to be with respect to the Great Commission. This is very interesting. The standard for our rewards are not left in the dark. That our rewards when making or being with Jesus as we know is just one aspect of it but that there are rewards in heaven and that those rewards will be according to our passion and our drive as far as fulfilling the great commission is concerned there are many aspects to the world to world evangelization those who are sent forth i remember growing up sometimes you would uh, you would attend you know certain um programs crusades and they would ask people how many of you are ready to dedicate your life and go to the mission field and sometimes you see people just come out crying and they meant what they were doing as they came out because some of them had to shut down everything now as much as we love the missionaries who are doing their all I want you to know that world evangelization let me repeat for your understanding part of the responsibilities of any believer in Christ is to be an active contributor towards the global harvest. It is not an option. 
it has nothing to do with being called into the fivefold ministry or not. And you know, um, I say this with every sense of sadness. We pride ourselves, even in ministry, using mundane parameters of success. In the mind of God, no matter who you are and no matter what you do, if it does not translate to the conversion of souls, you are not much in the kingdom. That is the truth. It's as simple as that. Never see a soul winner and believe that soul winner is wasting time. The soul winner cannot preach, but if he can bring people to Jesus, he is great in the kingdom. It's important for us to redefine our success by superior spiritual references. There are many, many people as believers, even as men of God, in a whole year, you can literally count by hand the number of people who are saved. It's a waste of platform. It's a waste of grace. 2.6 billion professing Christians this is not an advocacy of an evangelist. This is a cry that is in the heart of God. And listen, let me tell you the truth. The Bible says, I shall not die. We fear death a lot, but the Bible says that your longevity in the kingdom, among many other factors, is connected to your participating in the Great Commission. I shall not die, but live and declare. In other words, if your life is not actively contributing as far as, as the Great Commission is concerned, there is no justification for your longevity. Hmm. Are we still together? Power was given to the disciples with respect to great commission, the Great Commission. Influence with respect to the Great Commission. Today, we desire power, prosperity, fame, but in isolation to the Great Commission. All of the engracings that come from God to the believer are supposed to be tools that will be used eventually for the harvest. So there are many people praying for the grace for miracles, signs, and wonders. And it is absolutely not connected to the Great Commission. No wonder those you read about in the Bible and those you read about you know, in modern history, we call them God's generals. The reason why we do not see the kind of power and manifestation of the Spirit in their lives was be, that we saw in their lives was because their attention was not on power. Their attention was not on the miraculous. Their attention was on fulfilling the Great Commission. And whilst they went, the Bible says the Lord walking with them, confirming the word with signs following. In Acts chapter 8, when you read from verse 5, the Bible speaking about Philip said that Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ in obedience to the mandate. He preached Christ. As soon as he got to Samaria, there was no other business. Listen, these guys were so intoxicated by this assignment. If they found him, themselves in a city, whether they were free or in chains, their, their prayer point was not freedom from captivity. Their prayer point was, how do I? Everybody was a harvest to them. Everybody. If they were in the prison, it was an opportunity for everybody. The jailer, the prisoners, everybody, his family were harvest. They saw a damn cell rejoicing, prophesying by the spirit of divination, a harvest. They were flogged and taken to prison. They were harvest conscious. If you're together, say amen. amen. They never allowed any opportunity to be wasted. You make a mistake of bringing Paul before any of the council, give him five minutes to open his mouth and you will almost be converted. He, he coordinated his intelligence, his energy. When Paul was in prison, you would think he should be frustrated. He's thinking, okay, if I were free now, I would have been reaching these people. Let me at least write a letter, a letter to this church. I hope you are still well behaved. I'm coming out soon, and I assure you when I come out, I'm coming straight to you. If you come out of prison, won't you run away? <laughs> Go and read your Bible. The mandate that Jesus gave us requires a level of aggression. This is the reason why when you love your life, the Bible says you will lose it. You have to love him more than your life. That your life is all about the Great Commission. Today people desire fame. 
Today, people desire to be celebrities, respectfully speaking, even as men of God. We desire elevated platforms, and you will be surprised that in all of that desire, the purposes of the kingdom, even world evangelization, is the least of our concerns. Great men like David Yonggi Cho, and while these men had the opportunity to serve the purposes of God in their lifetime, the reason why they modeled such level of increase, such level of excellence in church growth was because at the back of their desire was world evangelization, not fame. Same with fathers in the faith like Baba Deboe. I remember when he clocked 80, um, his mandate was to be able to win I can't remember how many, how many, about 8 million souls with the remaining time he has. Can you imagine? You ask a man, what do you want? And anything he says will almost become an instruction for you. And yet he says, all I want is 8 million souls. That's what brought about the Light Up campaign globally. That within the time, I remember one time, you know, just respectfully speaking, I was speaking to one of his people and I said, I hope you people get to rest. Please tell you know daddy you should take some time to rest and he said no he will rest when he gets to heaven as far as the earth is concerned i must walk the works of him that sent me this is a man in his 80s and there are many many young people jumping up and down crying and say i want a double portion of his grace without a double portion of the desire world evangelization please hear me no matter how sophisticated you are as far as revelation is concerned, if your life does not directly translate to soul winning, effective soul winning, when it has to do with soul winning, numbers matter. When it has to do with discipleship, numbers may not matter. But ladies and gentlemen, soul winning is one soul at a time. If you win 100 souls versus 10 souls, 100 souls are better by far. But when it has to do with discipleship, you can have 5,000 members versus 20 members and you are dealing with 20 more effective people. I repeat, in soul winning, numbers matter. That means our lives must be all about using every scriptural mechanism to bring people to Jesus. Hallelujah. To bring people to Jesus. One time I was told that that the geo was preaching among pastors it was a pastor's conference or so and when he was done preaching was it his leaders or there about i can't remember the story exactly then he made an altar call these are people he trained but there's no taking chances who knows <laughs> may god restore our passion for souls <laughs> hallelujah May God restore our passion for souls. May God increase our passion to be greater than our desire for power. May God increase our passion for world evangelization to be greater than our passion for money and fame and all of these things. I am telling you that all that we seek only finds its value when it is connected to purpose. In this case, world evangelization. This is the first component. So if a man fails by any earthly standard in life, and you spend your life bringing many to Jesus. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Please give it to us. It says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. We have converted soul winning respectfully speaking and focus it largely as a tool for church growth rather than world evangelization as sincere as that is there needs to be an adjustment to our understanding the purpose of soul winning is not more members in church the purpose of soul winning is to see that the message the gospel gets to the lost are we together now yes and everyone including those hearing me now all the who are connected across the globe it is your business don't just be around the harvest field you are not a laborer because you are looking at the field you are not a laborer because you are near the field you are a laborer to the degree to which you are actively participating in the harvest the second component very quickly please write the second component 
of the mandate that Jesus left with the church is called discipleship. Please write it down. Discipleship. The second component, discipleship. Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20. Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority in heaven is given to me in heaven and earth. 19. Go ye therefore, now watch this now, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 20. Teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And while you are about the business of teaching and guiding them to observe, I am with you all the way to the ends of the earth. The second component of this mandate Jesus gave us, the Great Commission, is discipleship. What is discipleship? The mentorship of believers to attain maturity and stature through doctrine. The mentorship of believers to attain unto maturity and stature through doctrine. This is what the Bible calls discipleship. The mentorship of believers, those who are now saved, to attain unto maturity and stature through doctrine. Another definition of discipleship, helping believers understand the principles of the kingdom. Helping believers understand the principles of the kingdom through the teaching ministry. Please write. Helping believers understand the principles of the kingdom, the ways of God through the teaching ministry. So we see that the first component of the Great Commission has to do with preaching the gospel. The second component has to do with maturing believers, mentoring them to maturity and stature through doctrine. The end product I wrote here of discipleship is personal transformation and maturity. The end product of discipleship, whatever you call discipleship, you know whether it is biblical discipleship if it leads to personal transformation and maturity. That means when you submit believers to any body of truth whatsoever, for that matter, if it does not translate to personal transformation and maturity, it is not biblical discipleship. Are we learning? So component number one, world evangelization. Component number two is discipleship. Now, do you know that component number two is the primary reason for the physical convergence of believers? What you call church, the ecclesia, as a local assembly is supposed to be an authorized platform where believers converge consistently. Are we together? There has to be a central point of convergence so that believers are mentored methodically, line upon line, precept upon precept. In Acts 2.42, the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So they had a place of convergence consistently. The purpose of church is not just to tie men who are loyal to one man of God, respectfully speaking. No, church is greater than that. It is supposed to be a place of convergence. Are we together? Where believers come and they are mentored to be effective witnesses, effective communicators of the gospel, and effective people to live their lives effectively and then to be agents of transformation as far as the program of God is concerned. Many aspects of the Great Commission focus on world evangelization and we ignore discipleship. This is the reason why when you get your harvest from the farm, please look up. I've said it here many times. Imagine with me that you go to the farm and you harvest, say, tomato or yam or whatever it is. And you just keep it in the field there and you do not take it into processes to package it. What begins to happen to it? It begins to decay. This is the challenge we have in the body of Christ. 
So we have several people who have encountered Jesus genuinely. But because of the absence of growth and maturity, some of them even attain onto leadership positions just because of longevity of their stay, not using the index of transformation and maturity. So if you have, respectfully speaking, a pastor or a leader or a head of department who now has influence to perform functions within the church or the program of God and that person has not been discipled he will only mentor people from the lens of his or her limitations are we together discipleship is very important and now I know that when we talk about discipleship it means many things to many people I'm talking about biblical discipleship the end of discipleship is not slavery and subjugation. The end of discipleship is liberty by communication of doctrine. I told you, you know it is biblical discipleship. If at the end of it, there is personal transformation and there is maturity. So here is a believer who is a product of world evangelization. Now he has come to Jesus Christ and he's now allotted by grace. Remember, there is one who is called the Lord of the harvest and he's the one who allots the souls to the various platforms. All that you have given me, Jesus said, I have kept. Nobody has the power to bring members to himself. It is God that allocates people based on many factors, including the faithfulness and the preparedness of the teaching priests. Are we together now? Yes. So when God brings people to koinonia and god brings people to any ministry he's empowering you to teach them and to mentor them to show them the ways of god is the reason why as much as possible the central focus in every church activity as much as possible must be the teaching of the word now respectfully speaking with all due respect sometimes we need to manage except for special occasions i understand but it, the, the centrality of a church activity, it should be centered around platforms that impart understanding. If you have, for instance, a church service of three hours and it is largely spent doing a lot of things that do not translate to teaching, then justice is not being done to the mentoring and the maturity of the people because the truth is it takes time to learn the ways of God. Are we together? Papa Hagen and many of the blessed memory, the reason why their products were solid people was because they spent time teaching. They spent time imparting knowledge. Sometimes they would have meetings for days and they were largely word-based meetings. Look at Jesus, the ratio of his teaching ministry to impartation, three and a half years to one day. The moment the disciples we are with him. All right, gentlemen, sit down. Occasionally, a crowd will come and he turns it into a crusade. And when he's done healing and doing all of that, go home. Then he sits with the disciples and says, let's continue. That was all he did for three and a half years. And then he said, now that you know, tarry until you be empowered. Look at the product of Jesus' mentorship. You want to know how well Jesus performed? Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the Holy Ghost came, Peter said, no, we are not in ignorance. He said, this is that. And this guy began. That was his first official sermon. From a student in training to now an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he defended the faith with intelligence. This guy said, look at his exegesis of scripture. He was preaching the gospel. He started from David. He now went to Joel, now to Psalms. And he ended his sermon by saying, this same Jesus whom you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. Who will not be caught to the heart after that sermon? The Bible says they were caught to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what do we do? And he said, repent for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah. And then you shall receive this promise for the promise is unto you and to your children and so on and so forth. Many believers today, the quality of believers that we have, respectfully speaking in the body of Christ, is largely a product of poor or imbalanced mentorship. So the lopsidedness in the quality of believers that are being produced, you can know the quality of discipleship 
be within any predefined territory by random sampling believers and testing their level of maturity and their level of transformation against factors like prayer, how they respond to challenges, their orientation about material wealth with respect to God's eternal standpoint. Are we together? All of these indices are parameters that you can use to literally gauge the maturity level of a believer. It then means that we have a responsibility as believers and especially as those who have been privileged to serve at the altar to ensure that we take the issue of discipleship very seriously to methodically grow and build believers until they attain a state of transformation and maturity. I have told us here that the value of empowerment upon a believer is when the anointing comes upon a mind that is transformed. Now notice, the gospel deals essentially with the heart or the spirit of man. Transformation by the teaching ministry deals essentially with the mind. The Great Commission is essentially a battle for the hearts and the minds of men. The hearts and the minds of men. The hearts and the minds of men. Hallelujah. When Jesus walked upon the earth, his emphasis was on the minds and the hearts of men. Say discipleship. One more time, please shout it. Say discipleship. And it is everybody's business when a father as a priest takes responsibility as a disciple to mentor and teach the children and all who are within your care the quality of the product that comes from your house will be added to the school that the children go to am i right on that now you make the job easy for teachers because well-behaved students are already on their way the, the well-behaved children will become well-behaved students. In addition to the mentorship that happens within the school, you now begin to produce products that can influence their peers positively. You've heard me say every national problem was eventually a regional problem, eventually or at the start, a family problem that was a product of carelessness and neglect. Every arm robber came from a home. Everyone disturbing society came from a home. And everyone today who is a joy to every society came from a home. A home there does not just mean a biological place. Even the church is a home. Hallelujah. Let me tell you the truth. The major problem I will tell you that has affected the quality of believers in Nigeria, in Africa, and globally so, is the ill health or, or the, the imbalance of discipleship. The, the lapse in understanding and approach as far as discipleship is concerned. You cannot raise mighty men by communicating substandard spiritual truths. It does not happen that way. Ordinary men came to David in the cave of Adullam and the Bible says he mentored them and produced men of power that he called them the men of David. These men were so dexterous and powerful. These are the kinds of men the kinds of men that God is looking for in this end time. And it is going to be through the instrumentality of discipleship. You are sitting under this teaching grace now. You are learning the ways of God. When life, when life comes to you in whatever form it comes, it is on the strength of the truths that you know that you are able to stand. Am I right on that? If you have been taught, for instance, that challenges are not unusual for the believer, when you find out that you are confronting challenges, you will not begin to make statements like, God, where are you? Rather, you will find out what does the Bible say should be the believer's approach and attitude in the midst of challenges. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid of? I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Is any man afflicted? Let him pray. So when as a matured believer, properly mentored, in the face of challenges, while one person is languishing and shouting for you as a believer, there has been a scriptural mindset that you have been given. Are we together? Yes. When you lose a loved one, if you have been properly mentored, part of the mentorship you should have received is how to manage people who transit in glory. Because Paul, in mentoring the church, he let us know that when people die in Christ, they are not dead, they sleep. 
And so in the midst of the pain that comes by being a human being, you are comforted by the fact that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Maturity has given you the fortitude to stand. Are we together now? Yes. If you are in a region where you are facing tribulation and persecution in the office, instead of bending to compromise, because of proper discipleship, you know the Bible says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you face diverse persecutions, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. On the strength of that maturity, you can stand, even if to stand alone. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you may cry, but you still stand for righteousness. That is the product of mentorship, not evangelism. Most believers chicken in the face of everything because capacity has not been built through discipleship. He says, if you turn aside in the day of battle, it is that your strength is small. Are we together? If you have been taught the purpose of wealth, when God blesses you, it does not bring pride because mentorship has balanced your understanding that everything in the kingdom finds its relevance as it is connected to purpose. So you can be a billionaire and yet you can serve in the house of God with humility because you know that a man can receive nothing except it is given to him. Are you seeing now? Your life is brought to order because of discipleship and maturity. How about the place of character? Now you learn that the grace and anointing can lift you, but it takes character to remain there. My little children, he says, of whom I travel until Christ be formed in you. So when you come with your lusts and anger and whatever, you are not ashamed. You come before the Lord like a threshing floor, knowing that in his presence, there is the washing of the water by the word. Are we blessed? Discipleship is the only hope for the maturity of the believer. Methodically mentoring believers and holistically so. I have always been an advocate of balanced mentorship and maturity. So your spiritual life is covered. Your life as far as relating with the cosmos is covered. Intelligence that translates to the quality of your life is covered. Are we together? No aspect of your life is left without you receiving wholesome teaching. When I'm teaching you on finance, I will teach it as if there is nothing else to teach. When I'm teaching on soul winning, I will teach as if there is nothing else to teach because it is line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. When you are teaching on the gift of the Spirit, you help the believer to understand and appreciate that there is such a reality as the gift of the Spirit. But then that the gift of the Spirit only profits the body when it is done decently and in order. Many of the excesses within the body of Christ includes the Nigerian church, the African church, and respectfully speaking, world over is a direct product of the inefficiency in discipleship our discipleship models must be reviewed because there are many discipleship models that end up leading to slavery there are many discipleship models that do not bring liberty respectfully speaking there are many discipleship models that simply bind people across a sect and does not bring liberty to be kingdom ambassadors. So when I talk about discipleship, the true proof that you have been discipled is your personal transformation and your maturity. What made you cry yesterday no longer makes you cry today because you have grown. And talking about growth, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11 Please give it to us. 13, 11, 1 Corinthians. Let's read together. Ready? One to read. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. This is the biblical index to measure maturity. Your thoughts, your words, that you have been so transformed, you approach life from a superior standpoint. 
If someone looks at you and says you're a failure, it does not become a prayer point. Mentorship has so built you. You are so elevated in your mind, you will not demean your transformation by paying attention to mundane things. You have been so indoctrinated that you are seated with Christ. You are of a superior race in Christ. That if someone looks at you and says you will not make it, your prayer will be for the person because you've been taught. You see that now as an example. The mandate that Jesus gave us requires proper discipleship to raise a very, very healthy, a very vibrant army for him. And this is the assignment that God has given the fivefold according to Ephesians chapter 4 when you read from verse 18. Ephesians 4 from verse 18. Did I get that right? Help me. He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. And the Bible says he gave some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, 11, my apologies. He says, for the edifying, verse 12 now, perfecting or maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That means the fivefold ministry in its entirety is God's strategy designed to help believers attain unto maturity, verse 13 says. It says, till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of Christ. He's talking to people who are already saved, but he's saying there is a, an experience of the fullness of Christ that we need to come into. If you're understanding me, shout a loud amen. amen. Your response to life your response to all the things that happen around your life is a testament as to how much you have been transformed. Hallelujah. That is the reason why the Bible says not many people should pre presume to be teachers because our judgment as teachers will be higher. You know why? God will say, I gave you access to the minds of millions for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. What did you teach them? You can literally tilt a whole generation towards error because of the power of teaching. And you can direct a generation back when Satan wants to destroy the sheep the first thing he does is to corrupt or destroy the shepherd it is very easy to destroy the sheep when the shepherd is out of balance out of reach out of order are we together that is why as shepherds we depend on god with all our lives the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall make straight your path. When it has to do with this mission of transformation and discipleship, there are no masters there. Because we are all students continually learning. We lean consistently on his grace as we help to make our contributions as far as building a robust army for the king is concerned. Your grace your grace i'm nothing without you your grace your grace shines on me it's your grace your grace i'm nothing without you your grace your grace shines on me my dear people let me give you a very big secret the greatest gift you can give any man of God is not a car the greatest gift you can give any man of God is not a house it's not a lot and money in the account as wonderful as that is the greatest gift you can give a man of God is submission to be transformed by the truth that comes from him to you any man of god who loves jesus and loves the people committed to him the greatest joy of every 
any man of God I know who sincerely loves God and loves his people is to see them evolve into superior spiritual versions in response to the truth that he's bringing that a weak man someone who came January February right now you look at this lady this gentleman you are filled with the Holy Spirit walking in the things of God loving Jesus being used by Jesus to do great things for the kingdom and then making personal progress in your life and destiny there is nothing that consoles and rewards a teaching priest as transformation if you become rich and you are not transformed it's still a trouble for the man Nobody wants to see ill-built people around him. We want to see dexterity and stature and power from the opening of your lips. It shows the, how you were properly mentored. That the way you speak, your words are communicated with grace in your heart unto the Lord. Your speaking has been cultured. Your life has come under divine order. And people will usually ask you, they will say things like, which church do you attend? Is th these are all attempts to say who taught you you are a sound product listen there are schools today that when Wayek result Wayek the, the the West African exam in Nigeria or jam because of the performance that the students have am I right on that people will usually go and say come we need to examine the curriculum because it's not that the students magically evolve to become the best they were subject to a kind of strategy that produced that result. So what we aim to do by the Spirit of God is to methodically pass us through a spiritual system, line upon line. Can I tell you, I submit to you by the authority of Scripture that if you submit yourself to the truths that you are hearing week after week with your heart being open, the opening of your heart is your own responsibility. Are we together? It is impossible to remain a failure. By every and all standards, your life will be nothing short of a sign and a wonder. Because the truths you are hearing are not cunningly devised fables. They have been tested, not just in our lives. They have been tested in the lives of those that we have received the baton from. And the Bible says, and that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture. You want anointing? There is a strategy. You want wisdom? There is a strategy. You want favor? There is a strategy. You want increase? That God should lift you and cause your voice to be heard across the nations. It is not luck. Mentorship is the key to stature and transformation. Is someone learning? That is why when Satan attacks your passion and your desire, to come to the house of God it is a real attack hallelujah because he knows that once the seed has been sown you cannot stop the harvest the only way to stop the harvest is to stop the seed from getting there in the first place and if he if he cannot get you to come to the house of God or stop you from coming to the house of God, the next assignment becomes to turn your heart to a stony ground so that even if good seed comes upon it, like the parable of the sower, the Bible says they that did not produce were those who heard the word, they did not understand it, they didn't mix it with faith and it did not produce anything. But in the name of Jesus, there's someone who is seated here week after week you may not understand what God is doing in your life but there is a wonder that is that is that is evolving believe me as you're submitting yourself do you know I have met people and have been humbled by their depth of passion and sincerely speaking without exaggeration as much as I've traveled across the globe I have seen people and I've been humbled by their, their sense of discipleship some of them do not have the privilege to be here directly but they have made up themselves they've made up their minds to submit themselves to truth and you sit with them for five minutes the excellency of their understanding even challenges you as a man of god whatever you want to do lord you can do through me Whatever you want to say, Lord, you can say through me. Wherever you want to go, Lord, 
Lord, you can go through me. I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours forevermore. I tell you the greatest way to say yes to Jesus is not saying yes is preparing to be used by him hear me again the greatest way to say yes to Jesus is not to verbalize yes you need that when it has to do with salvation the greatest way to say yes is not to say yes is to be prepared if I ask you come to my house and you pick my call and say I am coming and go back to cover yourself with blanket are you really coming the greater you may not even answer me but get up and jump to the bathroom i see your readiness to come by your preparation there are many tongue talkers there are many people oh god use me but the, the submission to be trained and to be built to become that battle axe there is laxity and you see let me tell you an advantage that we have and and i say this god sees my heart it's not because i'm the one speaking if you ever have the opportunity to have a teaching priest that is sound in doctrine and loves you sincerely, go back and lie down and roll before God and say, Lord, thank you for making my journey to knowing you and being used by you easy. Most people have no understanding. Let me tell you this. And I say it on behalf of every serious man of God. Most people have no idea the labor and the burden of being a man of God. Most times we just see maybe protocols, some little blessings that come, and especially younger believers, they just admire, and that, 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 that glamour is fueling their lust. All that is in their mind is the Jeep the man of God entered. All that is in their mind is the, the whole paraphernalia. These are all support systems just to make it easy. Let me tell you, the labor of the word is real labor. To sit down and get life applicable teachings. I preach an average of two to three sermons every week. I've done this for as long as I know. It takes under no circumstance, no matter where I travel around the world, if I will be around on Sunday, I must make sure the message to give God's people is fresh, is ready to be served. That is labor that comes by love. Listen. I'm not just saying this to, I, I hope you, I, when I teach like this, I get so uncomfortable. It's just that the truth has to be said. Submitting to the ministry of a teaching priest indeed, bringing balance and a holistic capture of the truths that number one, help you to know God. Number two, help you to understand the kingdom. And number three, help to produce personal excellence in your life keeping you effective from an eternal standpoint and excelling within the cosmos. I am telling you, it is a blessing. Many believers take for granted the labor that brings truths that build them. You'll be surprised someone who has been failing in business. You just come when a financial series is being taught and you get one, one truth that brings balance to your life. Managing pride, managing anger, managing lust, managing all kinds of things that would destroy you. How about the manifestation of the power of God? Witchcraft and curses and yokes from anywhere to anywhere and you come together. Those spirits join you to church and yet you leave them behind and go back as a free man. All kinds of yokes. Apostle for 20 years I've not found liberty in my life and God says go there I'm the one who is preparing this teaching priest I know what I put in them you go and sit down there and watch what happens but you see the goal is not for you to be a member and just keep watching no there is a training please listen to me there is an equipping it is a very painful thing to any man of God if you have been around his church or the spiritual circle for a long time and the evidence of transformation is not in you. Even if you are a giver, it is more than money. It is your transformation. 
that I was here. I taught like a child. I understood like a child. Look my spiritual understanding now. When you are assessed by life across a range of areas, your spiritual life, your understanding about Satan, about God, about life, about challenges, about victory, about success, you have been so fashioned and so framed. Now God can send you to go and be a man of God. That cry, remember when he sent you, you may have come as an usher, but your destiny is to be a prophet, an apostle to the nations. Mentorship is what evolves you from that cleaner to a mighty man. Men do not rise just because time is passing. Men rise upon the quality of the information, the sound understanding that is being imputed into their spirits. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And then let me submit to you, and I'm saying this respectfully. When God grants you access to come across the life of people who genuinely have results, respect that atmosphere most we live in a world where people downplay results as if it is by it's just lucky no no consistency is proof of mastery you can have short-term results by luck but you cannot have sustainable results by luck the bible says he that strives for mastery is not crowned except and unless he strives lawfully Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So, the great commission that Jesus gave us, number one again, the first component is world evangelization, reaching the lost. The second is discipleship. Are you ready for the third? The third component of the great commission is called territorial or societal transformation. Please write. This is the most neglected component of the Great Commission. This is the peace that has not been brought in. It is a tripartite mandate, but most discipleship in a lopsided way. Territorial or societal transformation. What does this mean? That the gospel that we bring and propose as designed in the mind of Jesus was supposed to penetrate systems and structures that society must feel the impact of the gospel any gospel that cannot penetrate and transform society is barren of many components of power listen the first area of impact of the gospel in society I wrote here is impact on the moral fabric of society please write it down under territorial transformation the true gospel when the church becomes light and the message of the gospel is really going far backed up by discipleship it must impact on the moral fabric of society what does that mean there has to be a change in the overall expression of the moral fabric of any society crime rate should, re should reduce disobedience should reduce there are many things that should reduce thank god for the prisons thank god for law enforcement agents but can i tell you the church is supposed to work in partnership with these law enforcement agents as far as diminishing the rise of moral decadence within society the church is supposed to be the pillar and the ground of truth to bring moral decadence to the minimum but when we have more churches and as the churches rise crime is rising all kinds of things are rising it may not be that the church is 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 important is that the content of our communication and the efficiency of our witness is now found wanting every time there was a revival and awakening in the Bible. It translated to many other things. When you read Acts 19, you will see that people brought their magic books. Am I right on that? As a result of their pouring, the Bible says they brought their magic books. They gathered them together and burned them. And the Bible tells us the financial worth of it. That is the gospel penetrating society. When Jesus walked upon the earth, it was not just the disciples and sinners alone that he spoke to. He went to the houses of those who were people of influence. 
For instance, Zacchaeus, his encounter with Zacchaeus saved many people who had been unjustly treated because Zacchaeus became broken and repentant and now used his influence to correct the manipulation and the corruption that he was having as far as tax is concerned. I fear that if society does not feel the impact of the church, not from a standpoint of fanatism, falling and rising only benefits us. Society has no business with that. When they watch believers fall and rise, they are just interested in seeing this superstition-like manifestation. It is the transformation that happens in society. Can I tell you, the moment your life, respectfully speaking, your ministry, and whatever platform begins to directly impact society you start drawing the nation the attention of certain people and they note you to be an agent of transformation and they begin to incorporate you in processes that help to transform society this is where men become nations hallelujah men can become nations i'm reminded of my great Greatly revered mentor in the Lord. Now he's gone to be with the Lord, Dr. Miles Munro. Aside from being a man of God, he understood this dimension of territorial transformation. And he translated his, own, his spiritual understanding to a context. When Nelson Mandela was released from prison, I understand that it was him and one other person that were sent as delegates to go and greet him and receive him. These were men who impacted the fabric of society. Man of God, if only the church claps for you, you are not doing well. Society must join the church to say, well done. We may not believe in you, oh, but we respect the fact that there is transformation. They may not call it God, but they should call it transformation. The hospitals should see the effect of the gospel. The prisons should see the effect of the gospel. Is someone learning? This is the mandate that Jesus left. The church in Africa is very ineffective as far as societal transformation is concerned. So the understanding of the average unbeliever about the church in Africa is that we're just a bunch of fanatics who like prayer and like falling down. Occasionally we prophesy and those who seem to be sound have revelation. End of discussion. And so they watch sometimes and they are also interested. Wow, come and see people falling down. And it does not translate to anything as far as societal transformation is concerned. These are they that turn the world upside down. Not just they that preach well. Not just they that laid hands. Are we together? By the time, say, the Judicial Council of Nigeria comes to meet you as a man of God and as a church, that we just came to recognize you because we have found out that all the products that come from this church have been active contributors to reducing crime within a territory. Now, that is light. You are the light of the world, not the light of the church. That in the prison, they can know your name and the person can say, I, I agree I'm a sinner. But thank God for this person and that person because you have added joy. I'm sure many of you were blessed and inspired by what our School of Ministry students did. You watched the video. We allowed them to place those videos, their visits to the prisons and the rest to be able to help and see that the concept of ministry is not just preparing for pulpit. Pulpit work only accounts for about 30% of ministry. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds. They will call your light good deeds. You are the only one who knows it is light. As far as they are concerned, it is good deeds they will call it. But all beings, the Bible says, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Hallelujah. Is someone learning? Territorial transformation. The first area of territorial transformation, I said, is impact on the moral fabric of society what is the second area impact on the quality of lives of the people within that territory oh this is important that if it is the gospel ladies and gentlemen it must impact on the quality of lives of the people hmm. in John chapter 10 and verse 10 Jesus said the thief cometh not but for to steal 
to kill and to destroy. Please let me have your attention. It says, I am come that ye might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Is that in your Bible? Matthew chapter 14, please. Give us from verse 16. Matthew 14. Give us from verse 16. Jesus said unto them, they need not to depart. This is Jesus. He finished preaching in a crusade and now he saw several people but because he was a portrait of the holistic gospel he paid attention to their needs and their well-being he said they need not depart give them to eat 17 how can such a preacher and a miracle worker the the embodiment of the gospel the reason for the gospel the means of attaining the life of god himself he showed us that the gospel does not just end in the spiritual health of the believer. That God is concerned about the quality of the well-being of believers. This is the balanced gospel. The gospel that just influences your spirit man alone and does not care about the overall quality of your life. There is a problem with that kind of gospel. Let me finish this scripture. Please leave it for us. Next verse. It says, bring them hither to me, five loaf now and two fish. The Bible says, verse 19, that he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves, two fish, looking up to heaven. He blessed and break and gave it to his disciples. Who were those who shared the welfare? Disciples. The same people he was training to be men of God. That means a man of God has a dimension of him, if properly mentored, that must serve and care for people, even at their physical needs, to see to it that their lives become qualitative while they know God and serve God is a balanced view of the gospel. There are people who have erroneously taught that the gospel does not have a place in the overall well-being of people. I disagree. Jesus has demonstrated from scripture the gospel captures the tripartite nature of man spirit soul body the quality of your life should be improved because you are a child of god now it is true that the ultimate pursuit of the believer is not for things and unfortunately the gospel of materialism has had its its fair share of destruction in the body of christ thank god for the transformations that are ongoing but the truth still remains that the gospel that does not affect the quality of living of a people, there is something incomplete with that message. Jesus said, I am come that ye may have life and to have it more abundantly. When Jesus saw hungry people, he contributed to making their lives better. Jesus taught on finances. Is that not in your Bible? Jesus taught on demons. Jesus taught on himself. Jesus taught on the Father. The gospel being holistic must capture every dimension of men's lives. It must have an impact on the quality of the lives of the people within a territory. Nobody should sit down under a preacher listening to the gospel, being mentored and discipled, and then eventually cannot take care of his wife or children, lives a poor and a miserable life, not connected to purpose, not finding meaning for his life. There is something wrong with that kind of mentorship. When God comes, he elevates everything about your life and that includes the quality of your living. You believe that? Shout amen. amen. I was not like this when I started with God. I have never been motivated by money or motivated by self, uh, you know, natural things. But I'll be lying today to say God has not blessed me while I preach the gospel. And it will be wicked of me if I have benefited holistically from preaching the gospel. I must extend the same to everybody. Am I right on that? When I started preaching the gospel, there were privileges I did not have. The quality of my life today as a result of being a laborer, in as much as my passion has not changed, has only gone from glory to glory. God, in communicating that gospel, makes sure that your life also benefits from it. Why then will I teach you and focus just on your spiritual life and ignore other aspects of your life? It took me driving a car to come to church here. Is that true? That means while the focus is not on you buying a car and buying a house, eventually, as you serve his purposes and love him, his benevolence extends that far to reach to the nitty gritty. Did the Bible not say even the hair on your hair is numbered? He knows my name. 
He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls, and He hears me when I call. Listen to me. It is true that you can prosper as we call prosperity, material prosperity without Jesus. But there is something Jesus brings to a life that only him can give you that kind of prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is not limited to knowing Jesus alone. The gospel also includes enjoying the benefits that comes from knowing the Lord. Let me show you one scripture. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. That should be Psalm 103. Please give it to us. There are five benefits that the Lord brings to men. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Please listen and learn. Bless his holy name. Verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not whose benefits? Everybody say all his benefits. One more time. Say all his benefits. There are benefits that God gives people by reason of knowing him, loving him, serving him, living for him. That is never the motivation for loving him. But these are consolations that come with loving him. Are you ready? Five of them. Never forget. Verse 3. Number 1. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, the salvation of your soul, receiving eternal redemption through his blood the chiefest of all benefits but not the only one benefit number two who healed all thy diseases is that in your bible benefit number three who redeemed thy life from destruction deliverance and preservation benefit number four who crowned thee with loving kindness and tender mercies honor is a benefit and then finally read this one if you are a christian ready one to read who satisfy stop what part of your body does it satisfy aha uh -huh. who satisfied thy mouth with good things so that on account of the efficiency of your life your youth is renewed like that of an eagle this one that renewal of your life is directly tied to what enters your mouth If nothing enters your mouth, something will happen to your youth and something will happen to your vitality. The quality of your life is also incorporated in the gospel. Please find a way of believing this. I have vowed under God that I will never by God raise a people who are just spiritually vibrant and then be careless about other aspects of their life. I'm a man of God who will be very intentional and vocal as much as God grants grace in communicating the whole counsel of God as it leads to the overall excelling of believers. We should never have workers, for instance, in Koinonia who are having their children not go to school and it does not matter. All you are doing is being a good worker. That will be hypocrisy. When their lives are improved, listen, do you know the church as an institution, the church as a corporate institution, there is no nation I know, maybe aside from the Vatican, there is no nation as a church of believers that is an institution on its own from a governmental standpoint. There are non-Christian nations and platforms that they have, they have, they literally control the economy and it is, directly to, is, is directed to serve whatever cause they stand for. There is no such thing like that in the church. So the church largely depends on the excelling of the membership and their benevolence as it comes to the treasury. Am I right on that? That means when there are people who are incapacitated, there is so much that cannot be done by the church. And then the few who may be empowered to do it, if you are not careful and you become a beggar to too many people, they will erode the purity of your message using the pottage of stew that they give you to eat. Are we together? There are many people who are poor and helpless in church, bankrupt of influence, and yet we act as if it is not an issue. 
the gospel if it is Jesus you are teaching who is an epitome of love and it's in the character of love to give then it means the first thing that should happen to me is that my heart should be so purified that money and material and mundane things should never take his place however while I focus on him he does not leave my needs attended unattended to eventually my life should be a holistic capture of the goodness of God is it not in your Bible it says oh take and see not just that the Lord is Savior that the Lord is good are you learning the Great Commission growing up I saw many missionaries and respectfully speaking with all due respect and honor to all who are in the mission field today most people have do you know why evangelism is almost a psychological threat to many people because of the condition of those who answered the call they answered the call almost to their pain right now you go and meet a young lady somewhere and say I want to marry you I want to go and see your parents and let me tell you God has called me to go to the vineyard as soon as we marry we're on our way to Iraq and the rest and the father looks at you and says so this is how you plan to reward me for laboring on my ch it doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus that the, the gospel, we have brought a context of the gospel that seems to be um, unattentive to the quality of the lives of people. Now, when your pursuit becomes ultimately an all materialism, I'm coming to Jesus because of a car, a house. I'm coming to Jesus because of a husband, a wife, because of promotion. Now something is wrong because your priority has been misplaced. While it is true that he does all of that, he wants your heart to love him, to serve him, to be lifted above every other God. The God of materialism, the God of gold. Are we together now? Yes. This is what needs to be balanced. The overall quality of the lives of God's people. Now, please listen. There are two ministries that have been seriously threatened in the body of Christ. And there needs to be caution and balance there. There are two ministries that have been threatened. Number one is the prophetic ministry. Number two is the ministry that has to do with transformation and empowerment even financial empowerment we must be careful in attempting to purify the body of Christ there are two ministries we are fighting and we are going to regret it because these two ministries are the ministry that played a, the greatest role in bringing the gospel the ministry of the prophetic was why the gospel worked and the ministry of kingdom financing are we together now I'm just digressing to place there are many believers today who because of the imbalances around the prophetic unfortunately which we have identified and we know that God is working on across Nigeria across Africa there have been many issues here and there there are two major issues with the prophetic that is now being corrected number one is the absence of genuine consecration so over the years there's been a lot of carelessness and lasciviousness around the prophetic simply because of the abundance and the charismatism around the gift I'm just teaching you this for your knowledge number two has been the purity and the word compliancy of the practices many of the practices around the prophetic circles are largely extra biblical and there's no time one day I hope I'll have the time to teach you on the prophetic and the apostolic ministry the very nature of the prophetic ministry is controversial all the controversial manifestations of Jesus in the Bible was when he switched prophetic are we together so there is already a natural propensity of being in a place of, of where you can provide error and confusion that is the reason why a true prophet must balance it by being sound in scripture this has been the greatest mistake of the prophetic over the years absence of consecration carelessness around the altar and then number two principles and practices that in many regards are very disdaining and completely antichrist but that does not mean the prophetic as a ministry should be thrown away just because we are trying to purify it in my opinion and respectfully speaking even though i'm teaching on the great commission the greater problem that needs to manage to be managed is what is brewing right now the arrogance 
of the apostolic ministry. This will cause more danger than the disaster of the prophetic ministry. Because naturally, and by apostle, I don't mean whether your name is apostle, Joshua, Selma, no, 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 that's not the idea. The apostolic ministry generally, all through scripture, Paul, Peter, modern history, the apostolic ministry generally comes with a sense of pride and a sense of superiority above other ministries. It is a natural weakness that comes with the apostolic ministry. When you see a true apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who is humble, it didn't come by default. It is a product of the dealing of the Holy Spirit. Now the apostolic ministry needs to be careful as we manage and deal with the matters that have to do with the prophetic ministry. Because it was through the prophetic ministry that apostles were even born in the first place. You see that? And we have to be careful. There are people right now whose lives cannot be changed because of the prophetic ministry because it looks like they've been squeezed. We are trying to do what Jezebel did to the prophets. We need to be careful. Hallelujah. There were prophets who were under the custody of Elijah who were in hiding because of a threat that came to them. Now, there are many young men who have a genuine prophetic calls, but because of the, the overall image of the prophetic, the prophetic is a great blessing. It remains an eternal blessing. What we need to do is to pray, and I'm saying this on air, I'm saying this respectfully. Let's pray for all our colleagues and brothers and sisters across the world. Those who have been given to compromise and the bankruptcy of consecration, provided Jesus has not come, there is still room for renewal and transformation and repentance. And then to re-examine prophetic practices in light of scriptural strategies. These are the things that need to be corrected. But while that is happening, the apostolic ministry needs to quickly go back to the threshing floor and start repenting from pride. Because when we are done dealing with the prophetic ministry, we'll find out that the pride and the imbalances, false teaching is worse than false prophecy. You see, I can prophesy to you falsely, and you can know the truth in one moment. But when I build you around an error, I have carved you on stone. It will take God. Are we together now? It's not easy to transfer false prophecy, but you can transfer imbalance. You can transfer false teaching. So there is a bigger problem across the Nigerian and African soil. And that is there has to be a restoration of doctrine. Step one is to admit that the best of us does not know everything. And then to know that God has only committed dimensions to us. We are mandated by God to be effective within the dimension given to us while appreciating the other supplies in the body, which includes the prophetic ministry. And then to be on our knees praying for the overall health of the church. An attack on the prophetic is an attack on the church. An attack on the apostolic is an attack on the church. Rejoicing over the downfall of others is going to be a catastrophe to our life. Because when there are no prophets, it will hinder the manifestation of the program of God in many ways. Are we together now? Yes. So this, I just thought to bring this in because I, 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 there, there is a, many people who are called to empower the church, even financially. We have pushed them out of the scene and with all their ideas and their wisdom, billionaires and millionaires, and now the church is looking for money. And our bank, because we have ignored those ministries, is now beginning to push us in compromise. Some of them came with, some of them are veterans in business, veterans in economy, and they brought their hearts sincerely to serve the body. Like any other ministry, they will have their error. Everybody, listen, everybody is a fanatic to his area of call. So when you find people emphasizing an area above another, it is simply the fire that comes with the bias of their call. If I've been called to lead you in prayer, I will teach you prayer as if there is nothing else to do. If I've been called to empower you financially, I will teach you finances as if there's nothing else to do. It is simply the fanatism that comes with the call. But that does not mean that we should throw away many people. There are many believers now, many churches now, many circles now. Their number one prayer point is finance many projects to do but those that god has empowered to come and serve the body we are pushing them away in a bit to try to clean the church it is a mistake there is a referee a man who is playing football cannot assess other footballers there are people outside the field who assess everyone 
the Bible says, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Are we learning now? I'm saying this because there is a generation that is learning anything they find. And that generation is going to be a disaster if balance is not brought to their life. What threw Lucifer from heaven was not lost. It was pride that translated to treason. God himself opposes pride. We have to be able to manage people and when we observe wrongs within the body of Christ, we must communicate the truth in love. I repeat, the truth in love. Once the truth is outside of love, there is a serious problem. Now, I have sensed in my spirit that there is trouble within the spiritual climate of Nigeria, Africa, and across the globe. We have insulted the West and made it look like they are all cold. They are not serious. We have no idea some of the moves of God that are still being preserved. I have met people across the world, Europe, the US. I am telling you their spiritual fire and vibrancy and consecration. Some of us do not come close into it. God is everywhere still with witnesses he's raising. We need to be careful, Nigeria. Our arrogance may peg us and abort something prophetic that God is giving us the grace. Just because in this season, God has put the lamp on Nigeria, we must not make the mistakes that has happened in the history of the Nigerian church. We must approach this mission God has given us with profound humility. Otherwise, our bishopric will be taken and given to a least nation that may not seem to represent the purposes of God and God will raise mighty men and women. I'm saying this because the pride that is around believers, especially the Nigerian and the African church, we need to be careful. Beginning from myself, all of us, there's no tell them when you are discussing this, is a message from God to everybody. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. Your name is to be hallowed. As anointed as we are, when we are sick and we pray and nothing happens, we run to the hospital. If we destroy the ministry of the hospital simply because the healing anointing is there, the day your anointing cannot raise the sick, there will be many people Many people today have died who are not supposed to have died because the kind of teaching that came downplayed the hospitals in an attempt to describe the superiority of God's power. I walk in signs and wonders is a grace that God has given, but we have a medical team, a responsible and professional medical team. Are we together? I have prayed for people. I have given them money to go to the hospital. I have gone to hospitals to visit people myself and to pray for them there. And I don't do it with any sense of shame or whatever it is. If we don't repent from some of these falsehood, life will be disgracing us one by one because of the imbalances that come from us. The, the earlier we admit this, the better for us because the days that are coming will expose our limitations in ways that will bring shame to us. A man of God is called to teach truth as revealed to him by God whilst respecting other supplies that are within the body. I emphasize again, the prophetic deserves an eternal honor. It should be corrected, it should be balanced, and we are praying, we continue to pray that out of the ashes of lack of concentration, consecration and all kinds of wrong extra-biblical practices, that God himself will walk upon the heart of those called into the prophetic ministry to become a portrait of authentic prophetic ministry. But we who God has called into the apostolic especially, we must manage our, our overconfidence with pride. You see, let me tell you, my, the bit of my work with the fathers of faith in this nation has taught me something. There are many things the fathers see and you see them keep quiet. They only talk when they're in the place of prayer. Let us learn. There is something they know that we do not know. I repeat to you, the Bible says, he that thinketh he stands, let him take heed lest he falls. If Jesus as the Son of God almost fell in Gethsemane, then we need to be careful. Our overconfidence will only give Satan room to disgrace us. There is an approach to ministry with humility of heart 
as by people who have been helped by God and that must be the template we approach people the Bible said blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy are we together yes I've met a few people in my life and sometimes when I see those people they want to run away from me because it looks like oh there's a there's a stigma maybe they think I will insult them and this and sometimes I draw them and say how are you this and that may God bless you if you ever give room to listen okay you may need to adjust this just adjust this one adjust this we are praying for you and that's it but we need to be careful especially the generation that is looking up to our lives those ones that have not even started you see what the devil is already doing with them the church is called to pray we pray for one another so that in an attempt to fix a pipe we don't close a dam how did I get here the quality of your life that's what that's what brought me I think God wanted me to say this hallelujah so believers learn it doesn't matter what church you belong to respect the prophetic respect the apostolic respect the pastoral respect the evangelistic are we together respect the ministry of the teacher respect elders now forever for as long as Jesus remains we will keep seeing all kinds of errors and mistakes that require correction and as much as God grants grace, we will do so in love while watching our own lives. Let me tell you the truth. The correction that has come to the apostolic prophetic ministry, maybe in the last three to five years, I truly believe is the will of God. But we must know when it has come to an end. Let me show you a scripture God showed me. Can I show you? Psalm 76 and verse 10. Give it to us. Let's read it. And then I'll finish my teaching. One, two, read. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of the wrath shall thou restrain. Keep that scripture there. There is a way the anger of man can bring praise to God. That is what has happened. It is the anger that God has planted in the hearts of many people across the body of Christ that has helped to wake people suddenly. You see that? It has awoken people to doctrine. It has awoken people to consecration. It has awoken people to purity. Awoken people to prayer. Awoken people to all kinds of things. There is an anger that God himself allowed in the hearts of man that has brought praise to the Lord. But the remaining of that anger, God is now restraining it. He's saying it is enough. The mission of that anger has been fulfilled. If you continue, you are walking in the flesh. The wrath of man shall praise thee, but the remainder of that wrath shall thou restrain. The purpose of the wrath is to bring an awakening to those who are sleeping. But when that awakening has happened, then there must be grace. It says in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down. There is timing to it while you are still angry. Is somebody learning? Are you learning? This is very important. So don't go around pointing hands at people and be a judge and say this one, mm -mm, that's not your business. We must be at our knees praying. Anybody who God exposes an opportunity for transformation, for repentance and change, and he plays with God in God's intelligence, there is a system already within the economy of God where judgment is meted upon stubborn hearts. Leave that to God. It is his business. Are we together now? Yes. In the Bible, there have been all repentant people where in the presence of correction by the Spirit through men, they did not listen. God has a system of bringing them to his righteous judgment. But as far as we are concerned, the ministry of truth in love backed up with a genuine heart of prayer and passion for the body of Christ remains the end time secret for survival. As a man of God, you will never hear me open my mouth to criticize a church to criticize another man of God and far be it from me to criticize the fathers of faith there are fathers no matter what they do your own is to pray their age and their track record has shut your mouth forever the only person who can really talk to them is God are we together yes more these are protocols in the body of Christ that most people do not understand For this cause, many are weak. For this cause, many are sick. For this cause, many do sleep. But to wrap up my message, 
I was talking about the gospel impacting the quality of your life. How many of you truly want to know God with all your heart? How many of you truly want to be transformed? How many of you want to be able to take care of your families and children truly without thinking twice? How many of you want to be able to give to the program of God without thinking twice? How many of you want to live purposeful lives? That is what the gospel was designed to do. So in receiving the gospel, do not, receive, do not reject the welfare package that comes with the gospel. God wants to attend to your needs. And once you have your priorities in place, do not reject it. Hallelujah. There is food on my table at home. That's why I can shout and preach. Even if I fast, I can shout because I love God, but with a consolation that there is something on my table. I want to make sure your table also has something there. So the gospel, the third dimension of the gospel is territorial or societal transformation. And I told you the gospel must impact on the moral fabric of society. The gospel must impact on the quality of lives of the people within that territory, giving them a sense of empowerment, a sense of purpose and direction. And finally, the gospel must bring advancement in all spheres of society. All spheres, technological advancement, educational advancement, advancement in the area of health. When you read Genesis 41, we'll not read it, just write it for sake of time, from verse 37 to 57. This is the exaltation of Joseph in Egypt. Joseph's relationship with the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Bible was intact. He refused to compromise all through his stay. It led him to the prison. And after many years, God brought him out. And Joseph became a prime minister, are we together? By the level of his transformation, backed up by the spirit of grace. Now, Joseph was put through influence in a position where he could govern. And look what happened to the world because of one man. The, the excellency of his knowing God came and it, it translated to the health of Egypt even in the place of famine. Imagine if Joseph did not provide that economic solution. Jacob and all the other sons would have died and the program of God would have been aborted. Can I tell you? Listen to my message. Let me refer you to my message, Commanding Salvation Over Territories. I told you that our territories are also evangelists. There is a message only your territory can speak and there is an audience that has been designed to listen to it. Results speak, territories speak. You can command salvation like it happens to an individual. Salvation can happen over territories. You read the stories of the move of God across islands like the Fiji Island, the wealth revival, and you find out that going hand in glove with the move of God were advancements in education, advancements in health care. I believe in the gospel that permeates the tripartite nature of man and then extends to society. Thank God today for the Christian schools that we have across this nation and the world that preserve morality. Are we together? and help the, the students that are there to keep growing. Thank God for the Christian hospitals we have today as a contribution to the health of people. Thank God for other platforms, technological uh, um, platforms and other platforms that are adding to the health of society. We have received the blessings of others. The world is waiting for your own. We're able to preach the gospel today to thousands of others across the globe because somebody allowed his creativity to be a tool for the gospel. Hallelujah. Yes. My message tonight is to redefine the Great Commission. To one who sees the Great Commission only as world evangelization, that is powerful, but that is only one over three. To one who sees the gospel as just discipleship and mentorship, that is wonderful, but that is one over three. And to one who just focuses on welfare and well-being without impacting on the hearts, the spirits, and the minds of people, that is also one over three. It is world evangelization plus 
discipleship and mentorship plus societal and territorial transformation that equals the mandate Jesus gave us and if we fulfill this mandate correctly something will happen to our territories something will happen to the world before Jesus returns this is our mission this is why we are here this is why we breathe this is why we learn and do all the things that we do we sleep for this reason we wake up for this reason we are spent and we spend for this reason that someday when everything is said and done, when Jesus returns, he can come and tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. Are we together? And if you go and meet him before he returns, you will still hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. This is how to live a life of wisdom. This is how to live a life of value. Spending your life just desiring to build a house or buy a car or even be a preacher or have a church, as wonderful as that is, it is very mundane and inferior with respect to this noble call. And this is not a man of God's call. This is everybody's call. You can be involved in world evangelization by praying, I have taught you, by being actively involved in the mission field and by giving. Can I tell you, some of you have never interceded for souls. Everything about missions is none of your business. Some of you have never spoken to anybody about Jesus Christ. Or once in a while when you feel emotional. Look at the lady who came here to testify. God bless the woman or the man, the worker who led that person to Christ. Thank you for not keeping quiet. Thank you for insisting that they come to Jesus Christ. And there are some of you, as you are looking at me now, your one dollar, your one naira has never been part of the salvation of any. I'm not coercing you for your money, but I love you too much to not tell you. Let me tell you, the value of your money is when it has a place in this world mission. There are very wealthy people across this nation, across the globe. We give for other courses that are far inferior to world evangelization. Let me challenge you. The resources that God gives you, there is part of it that is for his program. There is part of it that is for your blessing. It is the truth. World evangelization. How about discipleship? When you invite people to church, you are not just trying to increase the membership of a man of God's ministry. No, that is an erroneous orientation. When you invite people to church, you are participating in this second phase of the the great commission he said go and compel them go and compel them go to the byways and the highways compel them to come that my house shall be filled God Jesus himself gave that instruction I was glad when they said unto me when you are going to church and you hold someone and say please I'm, I'm inviting you I think you want to be blessed the person comes to sit down that person is a CEO employing 1,000 people you just brought 1,000 people to church in one man his transformation translates to the health of 1,000 people am I right on that yes everybody is connected to somebody somewhere somehow and when you give them an opportunity to hear the truth like some of you who are hearing now imagine those who have traveled from all across the globe to be here they return back with this renewed orientation impact is one life i have taught you at a time but one million is one in one million places every time you remove one you are literally removing one million it is one plus one plus one plus one plus one again plus another one that equals one million the one soul you brought to church is among the one million who have come you have made your own contribution to bring your one are we together now yes how do governments raise money they raise money from taxpayers and what the taxpayer may pay as an individual may not be much but combine it and it becomes trillions of US dollars trillions of naira and that's what they run the economy of nations with Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. Your life must be actively involved in discipleship. It is not just to the man. If you cannot preach, you can get the truth across to someone. Technology and social media has made it, instead of promoting all kinds of godless things, your life can be an active contributor, getting the truth to as many who need to hear. And then 
the third phase is our business societal transformation let me ask you two questions i asked you before you didn't answer the last time i hope you answer now whose life has been blessed because you are alive has someone gone to school because you gave your life to jesus has someone been able to eat today or tomorrow or any day because you are alive do you know how excellent and how healthy it is to live knowing that your life is contributing to someone look at the young lad that andrew brought that boy had his five loaves and two fish maybe for him and a few friends and jesus said can you allow us use this and let us feed many you will not be at a loss the bible does not tell us who took the 12 baskets but if i were jesus i would give it to the young lad hallelujah When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done all my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Lord, your mercy is so great That you look beyond our weakness And find precious jewel in married clay turning sinners into saints and i will always sing your praise here on earth and never after for you've told me heaven's my true home when it's all been said and done you're my life when life is done the day I was told Miles Monroe had gone to be with the Lord I was in worry for a meeting and when they called me and said this man just had a plane crash at first I said God why but then I remembered that it is not the amount of time we live that matters but to the degree to which our lives are spent in making this happen the day I heard that the great patriarch of faith, Billy Graham, had gone to be with the Lord. I said, this is one of the few men on earth who finished his assignment and stood back and was waiting. He literally had finished. He spent his life going from pillar to post. The day I heard that Reinhard Bonke had left, I thanked God for the privilege to have been in his crusades. And I said, this man gave his life. He said, Africa shall be saved. We are products of his prophecy today. Not too long ago, I heard that Pat Robinson, the founder of CBN, 700 Club, who had inspired so many people in his late 90s, just a little step to be 100, he passed on to be with the Lord. You see, they are going. There is a generational shift happening. But while many of us are just admiring and boiling and waiting, we have insulted the fathers, and some of them have said, you've insulted us, we are going. Now, we are moving step by step getting to that stage if we do not understand what the great commission is the day that the light of the nations come upon us let it not be that we will mislead a generation and then the ones we raise come and begin to correct us too and that correction will be harsh because they will say you spoke about those who went before you you did not show mercy now look at it you are messing up my mission as a man of God to not is not to do everything I've not been called to do everything I do not know everything but mine is to spend my life serving you, serving Jesus, serving the nations, serving my generation with all that I have in life and in death. Serving him sincerely, making our own contribution. This is all. I don't preach the gospel because I'm a preacher. I preach the gospel because I'm a child of God. Are we together now? So... The one who is saying, I am waiting until the day I'm an ordained a pastor. You're already a hypocrite from beginning. Everyone should leave this service today with a renewed passion for souls. 
You may not have the privilege to do one-on-one -on -one evangelism, but can you take one day in a week to pray for souls? One day in a week to pray for those in the mission fields. What of some of you who can give? You find a ministry that is involved in soul winning and the transformation of people. That is where your seed should go. How about participating in seeing that people are saved? A few minutes from now, I'm going to be making an altar call. And I know that there are many tonight, whilst you are listening, there are many who will come here. You don't know the joy in my heart when I see people leave their seats and come to stand here. It does not just show that a preacher is anointed. It shows that Jesus is winning. That he's winning in Nigeria. He's winning in America. He's winning in UK, in US, everywhere. This is why we do the things that we're doing. Hallelujah. And so believers, hear me. For some of you who have been called by God and you have ignored the call, you may not have the privilege to head a ministry. You may not even have a privilege to be global in terms of ministerial impact. But that which he has given you, the hymn writer says, I'll do as it beats me, whatever the cost. I'll be a true soldier. You've forgotten the song. Remember it all. It pays to serve Jesus, I sing from my heart. You will always be with us. I can't remember the rest now. Do you know, hold on. Do you know years ago, people would sing these songs and cry. They really believed it and they meant it. I love him far better. I'll serve you more truly than ever before. I'll do as it beats me, whatever the cost. I'll be a true soldier. I'll die at my post. I'll be here serving you all of the days of my life. I'll be serving you all of the days of my life. Lord, I'll be here worshiping all of the days of my up go back and listen to this message redefining the great commission don't assume you understood everything I said when you go back sit down and listen let the Spirit of God breathe and let your destiny come out of this message that you will see the role that God has called you to play whether in business whether in ministry, what you call purpose and destiny is simply the role you have to play. As far as this kingdom advance, this mandate is concerned, my greatest desire is to bring joy to the heart of the master in and through my life by serving him as best as I can, taking advantage of all the graces he's made available unto me. And this is my proposition for you tonight. Now that you know these things, may you be happy and blessed if you do them. Rise up on your feet. Please rise up on your feet. Hallelujah. We are going to pray two prayer points, but I just feel stirred in my heart to make the altar call. Then we'll pray the two prayer points. I do not need to tell you any other thing again. You've heard the message. You need Jesus. World evangelization includes you if you are yet to make it right with Jesus. And I'm talking to a dear brother, a dear sister, father, mother, colleague, relative. You may be seated in this auditorium and all the overflows following online. And Jesus is telling you, it's time to make it right with me. Rededicating your life to Jesus or making that decision the first time. Wherever you are, I want you to please leave your seat and come and stand right here. As bold as you can, knowing that you're coming to Jesus. God bless you. Come. 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 Koinonia, let's give them a big, big hand clap. Even so.
Come, Yeshua, come. Even so, take your bride away. Keep clapping as they come. Oh, my soul longs to see your face, my Lord. Even so, even so, come, Yeshua, come. Apostle, I'm tired. I want to make it right with Jesus. Even so, come, Yeshua, come. Even so, take your bride away. How my soul longs to see your face, my Lord. Even so, even so, come, Yeshua, come. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Jesus. I see my footballer friend, when you are saved, I'll pray over your football career. But now let's do the business of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know that there are many more across the overflows. And someone may be watching by way of television, internet, perhaps a rebroadcast. It is never too late to make it right with Jesus. As I lead these precious ones in prayer, I want you to join with your heart open, knowing that you are in the presence of Jesus. Can I request all of you who are in front, please lift your right hand in total surrender to Jesus. And would you say this after me? Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart as my Savior, as my Lord, and as my King, I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I am a child of God. Don't be ashamed of your tears. Say, I'm a child of God. From tonight, I go forward ever and backward never. Amen. Keep your hands lifted and let me pray for you. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come in to my heart. I declare over you, my dear brothers and sisters, that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over your life. Based on the authority of Scripture, I declare your sins forgiven, and I declare that you begin a fresh walk today in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. The power to live a victorious Christian life, I release upon you right now. And I declare you go from glory to glory and from grace to grace. The past is gone. You step into a new beginning. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Now, let me request that you please follow the counselors. There are counselors who are waving the placard. All of you together. My footballer friend, you are blessed, huh? In Jesus' name, you love Jesus. You play your football and God will lift you in Jesus' name. Let's appreciate them as they follow the counselors. Hallelujah. Thank you for your patience. Now, two prayer points, and we're done very quickly. Prayer point number one, Lord, I am available. Use me for your glory. As far as fulfilling the mandate of the Great Commission is concerned, please lift your voice and pray. Someone pray. Someone pray. Go ahead and pray. Is someone praying, I'm available. I'm available in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm yours, Jesus, I'm yours forevermore. I'm yours, Jesus, 
Someone pray. It's a prayer of surrender. I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours forever. One more time. whatever you want to do in and through my life as a contribution towards fulfilling the great commission my life is available send me Isaiah said here am I send me he said who shall I send and who shall go for us God is speaking to someone I'm yours Jesus I'm yours forever I'm yours, Jesus. I'm yours forevermore. Pray, my life, my energy, my intellect, my qualifications, my beauty, my resources, everything towards kingdom come, everything towards global missions, everything towards discipleship, towards territorial transformation. Whoever you want to lift, Lord, you can lift through me. Whoever you want to save, Lord, you can save. to start Lord you can start through me and whatever you want to end Lord you can end through me I'm yours Jesus I'm yours forever I'm yours forevermore. Final prayer point. And I want you to please listen, then we pray and we're done for this service. Father, because I have pledged my life, every resource I need, make it available unto me. For some of you, what you need is finances to make you an effective witness. Some of you, what you need are strategic relationships. Some of you are fresh graces and mantles from heaven. Some of you is a higher level of enlightenment. Lift your voice and pray. God is able to make all grace abound towards you for the purpose of kingdom come. Is someone praying, lift your voice. All that is required, I receive, I receive the resources, the influence, access, power, revelation, the engracing for signs and wonders, capacity to foot all kinds of kingdom bills. I obtain grace. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. For your glory, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my King. For your glory, I will do anything just to see Be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Wanna be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Our 
Hallelujah. Pray for the Great Commission like never before. Become an active soul winner like never before. Become an active kingdom financier like never before. Let your life contend for knowledge first for your own growth and then that it will give you the platform to be able to mentor and help and build others methodically and accurately. And then, by all means, may your life become a source of contribution towards territorial transformation. When it has to do with, ter with transforming territories, the mission is not just for Christians. The mission is for all of God's creation. Let someone eat because you are a Christian. Let someone go to school because you are a Christian. Let someone have an opportunity to go off the street of prostitution, of drugs, because you are a Christian. For he sends rain to the righteous and even the unrighteous. There is a dimension of godliness that must bless all and sundry without prejudice and without any biases of religion. This is the mandate Jesus gave. Let me pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, I pray for every precious person here, the engracing to be an effective witness, to be an active part of the Great Commission. I declare that grace rests upon you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, the grace to pray, the grace to give, the grace to speak, receive it in Jesus name the grace to preach the grace to teach the grace to demonstrate with your life receive it in Jesus name and I pray for you because your heart is stayed on God's program resources like you have never seen may God gravitate strange resources to your life in the name of Jesus Christ you will handle wealth beyond your imagination you will handle influence beyond your imagination. Access to the hearts of kings and nobles. In the name of Jesus Christ. And hear me. Because you have made up your mind to be part of the great commission. No devil will take your life before your time. In the name of Jesus. I bless you with longevity. In the name of Jesus. Anyone here under the sound of my voice. Appointed unto death either by accident, by sickness, by some demonic or diabolic means. It is hereby cancelled in Jesus' name. Hear me? For the sake of your overall spiritual health, spilling to your financial health and your family, everything that is a source of concern, that is stopping you from concentrating on the Great Commission, may my God solve it now. If it's a financial problem, may my God solve it now. Listen, it says, He that told you have asked for nothing, ask and you shall receive that your joy might be full. I pray again, whatever is a distraction to your Christian life that will not allow you to find peace, whether it is your bills, whether it's lack of a job, whether whatever issue in whatever area, I decree and declare, may my God visit you and give you rest. Visit you and give you rest. I speak to every ministry here in the name of Jesus. Fresh grace and fresh dimension of power. I speak to every business here. Receive grace to scale heights in business. I pray for everyone in government, every captain of industry, in the name of Jesus, be empowered for the next level. And we pray specifically for all those who are currently in the mission field. There are all kinds of mission fields in Nigeria, in Iraq, across several African places, far north. There are people who have pledged their lives. Some of them have died. Some of them, their relatives last saw them on their way to the mission field. In the name of Jesus, we pray fresh grace upon our missionaries. Fresh grace upon those in the villages, the hinterlands. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we decree and declare, let it please the Lord that in their lifetime, they will see the fruits of their sacrifices. And we also pray for families that have literally donated their children, their spouses for the work of the kingdom. In the name of Jesus, you will not regret saying yes to Jesus. 
For in Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen and amen. Hello, beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them. Because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. Tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching.